The question that you raised, what is a poem, uh, this week really engages uh, the, uh, the conflicting views, right? And um, it's always, it's a reality that uh, all of us have different uh, tastes, uh, we have uh, different perspectives, we have different experiences, right? So that's real. And uh, I would never encourage anyone to um, deny those. Right? Tasha Trethewey does for us in her work is say, don't deny not just her name per se in some kind of autobiographical self-reflexive engagement in a kind of ego-centered artistry, but don't deny the names, right? Or the idea of the selfhood, right, of these anonymous um, sex workers in these New Orleans brothels in Storyville, right? So Storyville somehow got to be more storied, right, than the women um, that worked and labored in it. And so that's something that I would argue that she's trying to um, upend and unend. Uh, so today I hope to offer a compliment to some of the more standard, conventional ways of understanding black poetry, poets, and poetics um, by putting an emphasis on sound and poetry. Now you might be saying, yeah, okay, Tracy, right. We've heard of Baraka, Langston Hughes, Robert Hayden, Gwendolyn Brooks. We have a sense of black poetry might sound like, depending on the writer and how he or she performs the poetry. And that's, that's of course, what, what Shelley said about what figurative language was supposed to do, that it was supposed to derange through a connection that required a mental process of connecting to things that were unlike, uh, but had some sort of way of, of, of bridging that gap. Um, but thank God that we have a story like Common Offers. I wish it was better known. If we can escape the categories, then we can achieve a lot of you know, broader knowledge about what it is that we're actually doing. So part of the work, I think, of these poetics is to escape these fixed categories. So I think you're exactly right. Blueses or the blues is the sort of the big umbrella, right? And you know, I'm, I'm arguing that um, part of it is sort of that form itself uh, or certain choices about form uh, constitute a sort of resistance in this, you know, and, and you know, the prototypical definition of resistance is always about, you know, arms. And I'm arguing that, you know, that, you know, that we've, we've got to, you know, we've got to, you know, we need a more elastic definition. So when I talk about resistance poetry, you know, that's sort of where I'm going with that. I guess I wanted to sort of give you a distinction. Um, two sort of general camps, and these are not hard and fast, but just something we could work with right now. One is, I guess, sound, po sound as a flourish, and one is maybe sound uh, idiomatically. What I mean is that you have the type of sound that may add much to the impact or enjoyment of what you hear, but doesn't affect the meaning when the sound is left out. There's risk in every, you know, uh, acquisition. That old saying, be careful of what you wish for. Yeah. We have wished for this recognition of, of this sort of inbuilt diversity in our uh, musical approaches. Um, poetry has worked, I think, in a much more difficult um, genre which is language because that language was not being created by us, it was sort of being recreated by us. It has been challenged and added to, right? But I think that but I think that this is how music has that greater fluidity that we refer to. Because it doesn't really have to explain itself in the ways that we think language we think that spoken word has to explain itself. The challenge that you know, in terms of that has to be created. I mean, another way of thinking is we know literary establishment is not going to create it. So that means another artist has to have enough interest and have to and study enough to be able, you know, so you'd have to have a certain amount 
a certain command of, of linguistics, whether you do a formal study of linguistics or not, but you'd have to have a real understanding of the language. The community did not approach a work of art saying, I wonder what this means. What if that work that the artists were doing was in, was in fact an organic <coughs> part of uh, what we think about on a day-to-day -day basis. This would be a very powerful difference in the way that we think about art, and the way that we think about ideas, and also the way that we think about ourselves. What people in the 60s and thereafter uh, said in response to that question was that the page would always be limited. You know, that there would, that's why that's only a score. And so on some level, the question that you're posing is what is, what is an effective or the most effective artifact, which is what I was, where I'm getting to when we get to Baraka today or, and, and Tracy Morris. And move us beyond obvious sentimentality as criteria for excellence rather than simply whether or not it's in a book, right? So you have to back that thing up, as it were. Mm -hmm. when, when your students are just like, well, is it, you know, it's not about how it's published or if it's published. It's like, what traditions are you drawn on? What's the technique? What's the craft behind the oral presentation that you're, that you're offering us? Uh, which is a, a bit of an omnibus word to encompass a variety of different aspects of poetry beyond those mm -hmm. words that, that appear or in, in, uh, in speech or on the page. And one is obviously the presentation context, which is where are you encountering that one? Are you encountering it in a print book? Is the print book coming from Norton, or is it coming from a small press? Uh, what is the small press? Different things are going to reach different audiences that way. And of course, nowadays, is it an electronic text? And does it incorporate digital animation, for instance? Is it spoken word? And if it's spoken word, does it incorporate some of these other media as well? So that's one. Another aspect is the, the literary history, the milieu in which the poem or the poems are created. So, uh, you know, traditional literary politics, you know, how does something become visible, as Jane Fountain says? How does it end up in an anthology or not? Uh, and in what anthology? I want to argue that in speaking to it, right, it's not just that it transcribes or describes it, but that kind of what Trethaway's verse does um, and what I would argue is a kind of imperative in the African-American poetic tradition is transforming it, right? Using the photographic image to transform the way that we see ourselves because historically the African-Americans within kind of early uh, daguerreotypy and photography um, often were so debased in terms of imagery. So that would be one um, aspect that I would, um, I would emphasize. In all the work that I do, certainly in my teaching as well, I'm just as likely to be dissecting a, a Kaye West lyric as I am a, a Nikki Finney collection, uh, because I do think that there's a continuity of expression, particularly in our African American literary tradition, that connects the oral and the written, that connects these, and it connects song and poetry. The Greeks, of course, knew about this, and I wrote about that in, in Book of Rhymes, but I think any tradition that you go to, you see this intimate connection between the desire to sing and the desire to, to create poetry that one and the same, contiguous. Uh, and, and that's really what I hope to explore today. Some of the things I'm thinking about as an artist and scholar, I'm an, I'm an actress and scholar, and um, I'm always really amazed at how much I share in common with poets. Um, and what I'd like us to think about is the ways that the art forms of poetry and theater are very closely related. I mean, all the way to poetics, we can see those type of connections, right? So, um, but our art forms are often created in private, yet are intended for public display through acts of sharing on both really intimate and grand scales. And so the intersection of poetry and theater in African American culture for me is so pronounced that as a performer and teacher of acting, you know, I have to tell my students all the time, they have to really think about the ways, and this is students across racial lines, the ways that black poets in particular have written these counter public spaces um, that from plantations to street corners to simple stages to proscenium stages, 
um, as a way to announce and perform ourselves into existence. She saved me a lot of trouble when I heard her talking about how someone had tried to decipher the numbers as like programming language or Morse code to no avail. They don't mean anything, she said. I just typed some numbers. <laughs> now, she's kind of laughing at herself as well. She said, I guess I'm not really deep. Uh, <laughs> the point, though, I would say is that for Martin, the search for meaning in language is always full of frustration, misrecognition, and disappointment. But that doesn't mean she doesn't find or doesn't want us to find her writing meaningful. The significance of the work lies in her perhaps failed, perhaps not failed, struggle to make the language say a true thing, and in our willingness as readers to be vulnerable and generous in our engagement with the text. What does it mean to accept that we can't master her, the text of her poems? This is one of the questions her work poses for us. <laughs>